start recording. Great. Everyone here got a copy of the assignment? Yeah? Nice. Okay, so uh, the assignment, all the assignments that I give you are going to be printed out, so with uh, space to put in your answers, and that's because it just makes it easier for me to mark them. Uh, so you have to do your work on here. Um, just a quick couple of notes. Okay. Uh, whenever I hand something out, you'll have a week to finish it. Okay, so it's due at the beginning of class next Wednesday. Okay, lots of time to do it. Uh, it's due at the beginning of class. If you think you might not make it to class or whatever, uh, just do what you have to do to get me that hard copy. So if that means uh, just slip it, slipping it under my door, uh, you don't have to hand it to me. Right, as long as you kind of take it to my office, um, that's good enough. And this. Okay, so whatever you gotta do to get it to me on time, that's what you're gonna do. And um, even if for some reason you can't come to school that day, you can still send me pictures to prove that it was done on time but I'll only mark the hard copies. In the past, I've marked stuff handed in by email, and it just kind of bogs down my inbox a lot. So you can send me pictures of it to prove that you did it on time, okay? uh, but as far as marking it, I'll only mark the hard copies. Okay? And that way you'll get feedback too. So I do spend a lot of time marking these because um, it's where I'm able to provide a lot of feedback for you guys. So. I don't know. It's supposed to be helpful. Take it or leave it. I've still got a couple of uh, these term schedules just to go. So does anyone, did anyone not get one? One over here, one over there. I can print more So, okay. So, a lot of question one on the assignment you can do already. It's just kind of like uh, I give you a little scenario, and then what are the variables? What types of variables are there? Um, part D for question one, you won't be able to, we'll talk about that just briefly next day. But like I said, it's it's due on Wednesday. You've got time. Okay. So, um, shouldn't be that bad. Okay. So just as a brief review, what did we do? It was just on Monday, but feels like a while ago. Uh, we talked about describing a distribution, right? So shape, center, and spread. So describing a distribution. We talked about finding the mean and finding the standard deviation. So it looks like we didn't do a lot, but finding the mean but also finding the standard deviation. So through the mean, we introduced sigma notation or summation uh, notation, right, and kind of talked about how that behaves. And then we use that to find the standard deviation. So we talked about finding the mean and finding the standard deviation. It's like a hum. I think it actually worked. Yeah. I'm blown away. I'll, I'll take it all the way to zero. See if I care. It's great. Way better. Um, all right. 
so not much more to talk about there. We've got new stuff to cover, right? Um, question two, you'll see part uh, E is finding the mean, and then part G is finding the standard deviation, right? So you'll get to show off your skills on the assignment. Don't worry. Yeah. And then a lot of that other stuff we'll learn today. Okay. So, just recall the example. So, how I like to introduce these concepts is just the same way that we were doing before, right? So, I've given you an example. It was kind of a boring example. Uh, how far did parrots fly in a day? Right. We'll still keep using those numbers. We just need numbers, right? A couple of numbers. Um, so, that's the example we'll keep going in. Um, I'll just ask a question and then outline how do we answer it, right, and the information that we need to answer it. Okay. So recall the example. Well, where did I steal it from? The distance flown. flown in a day by nine parrots is recorded below. I don't even remember making up this example. That's how boring it is. Recorded below in kilometers. Change the values a little bit. So we had 2.8, 1.3, 0 0.5, just one lazy parrot, 4.7, 3.5, 7.1, 1.9, 2.1, right? I can't even read my own writing. And then 3.4. So here's our data. Let's see here. We didn't have time to talk about the stem and leaf plot. Um, I'll sneak it in here. So part C, make a stem and leaf plot. Oops. of the data. Okay. A stem and leaf plot is, I call it a poor man's histogram, right? So it's just a quick way to visualize data if you just have a small data set, right? So if you just have a small data set and you want to visualize what the distribution looks like, then we can make a stem and leaf plot. Okay. So a stem and leaf plot is a quick way to visualize a small set of data. You don't want to do it for anything big. Uh, visualize a small set of data. The idea is that whatever your numbers are, you need a stem and then the leaf. Okay, so here, our stem is gonna be our whole number. So we're gonna make uh, a bunch of rows, I guess, with our whole numbers, okay? Listing our whole numbers. And then on the side, we're gonna tack on all our leaves. So what it's gonna look like, we will use our whole numbers as our stem 
and the decimal as our leaf. Okay. So what are the whole values we have? We start at zero and then we have uh, all the way through seven. Right? So the important part is that we don't skip any stems, right? Because the idea is to look at how spread out are these things. Okay. So we start at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is our stem. And then we separate them with a line. Each of these values is going to get transferred onto the stem and leaf plot. So 0 0.5, that's the first one. And so we just put the 5 here as our leaf. All right. So 0 0.5 just indicates 0.5. Okay. So this is our leaf. So that one's done. Which one's next? <laughs> 1.3 and 1.9. Those are my two ones, right? So after one, I'm going to put a three and then a nine. An important thing to keep in mind is that each number takes up the same amount of space. Right? Because remember when we were looking at our histogram and we said that each individual added on to the bar, right, a set amount. So same idea here, what we're essentially building is, well, that's why I call it a poor man's histogram, right? Because it just ends up looking like a histogram, you'll see. But the important part is that each value takes up the same amount of space. <laughs> so then what's next here? We've got 2.1 and 2.8. Those are my only twos, I think. 2.1 and 2.8. Three point four and three point five, and then four point seven and finally seven point one. That's way down here. So, of course, we had to do this when computers were expensive and computing was expensive, right? Now, it's not something that I would emphasize, but it is something that you have to know how to do. And just imagine, so you're going to just turn your head here, and what do you have here? Essentially, an Instagram. We don't have that many data points, right? So it looks a little bit uh, boring, right? But we've got this kind of distribution. <coughs> so it's just a quick way to visualize our distribution. Okay. I'll just make a note here. Make sure each leaf takes up the same amount of space. Takes up the same amount of space. Which fair enough, right? If they're supposed to be kind of stacked on top of each other to indicate how many there are on each stem. Um, technically, no, the leaves don't have to be sorted, but it just makes it easier if they are just side by side. Yeah. So any duplicates just count as you just stack them side by side. Right. Um, you could go even further. The reason you would want to have them sorted is you have to have at least five stems is a rule that we don't care about. Um, I guess I should remember I'm recording this. 
anyways, no one's going to go into the archives. Uh, I don't care about that rule. We ha Technically, there should be five stems. So if you don't have five stems, you have to split the stems. I'm not, it doesn't matter, but there's, that's why you would uh, sort them, but it doesn't matter. Think you can make a stem and leaf plot? Top notch. How about uh, some more important stuff? So that was my fake part C. So um, another question that we might ask is, just find the median distance flown, right? So last day we talked about the mean and the standard deviation. How do we find those? Those are for normal distributions, right? And then we said for non-normal distributions, we should be using the median as the measure of center and the interquartile range as our measure of spread, right? And so today we'll just go through how do we calculate those, kind of move forward. So next thing we're gonna do is find the median distance flown. So the median, what is it? First, in order to find it, we have to know what it is. The median is the value that cuts your data in half, right? meaning you have 50% below it and 50% above it. Right? Of course, in order to do that, right, we have to first sort our data. Right? So we're not just going to take uh, this data set and just take the central value. Right? We're going to sort it first from smallest to largest, and then the median cuts the lowest 50% from the highest 50%. Yeah. So first let's write out what the median is, and then I'll show you how to do it. So the median is the value that splits your data in half. Is the value that splits your data in half. So the smallest 50% of data points of data points are below it. And largest 50% of data points are above it. Fair enough. So to find the median, oops. There's really only two steps. First, and this one's very important, and I kind of throw it in there because often this will be a, I don't know, a multiple choice question, right? I give you data points just like we have here. And then I ask you, uh, the median is, and then you just pick the right option. And of course, one of the curveballs is if you haven't sorted it, that's going to be one of the options, right? Because you have to know to sort them. Okay? So first thing is you're going to sort your data. Technically, it doesn't matter if you go small, uh, smallest to largest or largest to smallest, uh, but it's going to make more sense if you go smallest to largest. So your data from smallest to largest. Second thing is Let me just copy these. I know they're right on your page, but it's a lot of scrolling for me. Okay. So here's our data. Pretend for a second that we have sorted it already, right? Then we would expect the midpoint to be somewhere here, right? Now, in 
the real textbooks, they go through and there's formulas for finding the position of the median and then you have to find that position and then look at the value. Um, I just use my, my own boop 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 method. So you just take your fingers and you do go kind of cross-eyed when you're doing it, so you might want to do it twice. But so you just start at the ends and then you boop, 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 boop. So you just boop, boop, boop your way in. So I call it the boop, boop, boop method. Or what I just realized this morning, the boop to the power of three method. Yeah. We'll talk about it. Don't worry. Don't worry, I'm gonna cover all the bases. So um, so we're gonna use the boop, boop, boop method. If you wanna know the official way, um, you can look it up, Google it. Oops. Second step, use the boop, boop, boop. Why three? I don't know. Just kind of happened. The boop, boop, boop method to find the central value. So here's our original data. Okay. And uh, like it was pointed out, right, it's gonna behave a little bit differently depending on the number of data points that we have. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you with these nine data points, and then we'll drop one and look at what, how it behaves with eight data points, and that'll cover both our options. Okay. So, nine data points sorted okay. so first step right we have to sort our data so just from smallest to largest we kind of already did it in our stem and leaf plot right but we'll just list them so 0.5 i've used that uh 1.3 1.9, 2 point 1, oops, 21.2.8, 3.4, 3.5, 4.7, and 7.1. Just count them, make sure that you got all of them. Some of these get a little slippery and you forget them and messes everything up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Beautiful. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we're sorted, right, you'll see, you'll go a little bit cross-eyed, but you can just always start over. I won't expect you to do anything more than 12 data points at the very largest by hand. So, um, starting at either end, boop, 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 boop. So because I land on the same value, right, that is our median. So here, the median is 2.8. Found the median. If we remove the seven point one data point, right, we'll have eight data points sorted. So same thing here, I'll just quickly write them out. 0 0.5, 1.3, 1.9, 2.1, 2.8, 3.4, 3.5, and 4.7. It's a weird looking seven. Okay. 
So we've just dropped one. So now we have eight data points. So the other option, right, if we come to the middle and we land on the same value, that's great, right? That is our median. But in this situation, right, what's going to happen is 4.7, oh, uh, boop, boop, boop. So now we landed on 2.1 and 2.8, which means, well, it's neither of these and both of them at the same time. So confusingly, to find the median, we're going to take the mean. But I know. But that's just how it is. And it's probably what you would have done if you had this problem and you're like, oh, I, it's both of them. I'm just going to take the average. right? So it's not that far-fetched, but how you indicate that on your little number line here is you circle both the values, okay? and then you draw a line down the middle, and that line represents the median. Okay? So now you're going to say that the median is 2.1 plus 2.8 over 2. Pardon? Yeah. I don't do math in my head. Um, and I have a math degree, so sue me. Um, no, I don't leave anything to chance. That's why. Um, towards the end of my math, my undergrad, I was doing things like one plus one in my calculator because I, I was so, I don't know, you just get so caught up in whatever you're doing. And one day I caught myself doing one plus one just to make sure it was two. Okay. So math degrees, they'll mess you up. Anyways, so there you have it. So the median. Right, in either of these situations, right, the whole idea is that here this value splits the lower 50% from the upper 50%. Here this value splits the lower 50% from the upper 50%. Okay. So we use the median, right, because it's more resistant to extreme values, right? Extreme values are outliers. So Let's pretend for a second that this value was not 7.1, that it was um, 700, right? And I asked you to calculate the mean, right, the average of all these numbers. The average would be pulled towards the 700, right? So the mean is going to always get pulled towards extreme values, okay? whereas the median well, the median when we're boop, boop, booping in, right, it doesn't care if this is 7.1 or 700, right, it's just counting the number of values, right? So that's why we use the median if we have these skewed distributions, right, because they're more resistant to extreme values. Let's write that down, shall we? So we use the median. We use the median, I'll put in brackets, and the interquartile range. We haven't talked about how we find it, um, but it applies to both. So the and the interquartile range, IQR, for non-normal distributions, Because they are resistant to outliers. Because they are resistant to outliers. Whereas the mean will be pulled in the direction of extreme values or outliers. So whereas the mean
that's the mean, gets pulled towards extreme values. So if we have something like this, which we decided last day, right, was a, a distribution skewed to the right, right, it's always skewed in the direction of the tail. The median would hang tight somewhere in the bulk of the data, right? So the median won't be too affected by this tail, whereas the mean, I'll just do an extreme example here, the mean would get pulled in the direction of the tail. If it's way over there, it's not really a good measure of center anymore, right? And so that's why we should be using the median. And the same kind of idea, if you have a normal distribution, oh, that one looks pretty good. It's the little things, right? Here, now we're symmetric, right? So there's no reason for the mean to get pulled in any direction, right? It's kind of being pulled evenly in either direction. So if you have a normal distribution, the median, will be roughly equal to the mean, right? If you have a normal distribution. So without being able to visualize data or anything like that, you could just look at the mean and the median, and if they're roughly the same, they won't be exactly the same, right? But if they're roughly the same, then you could probably assume that you have a roughly, approx a roughly appro approximately normal distribution. Throw in all those roughly, approximately, right? I can't think of another word for roughly, approximately. But if I could, I would throw it in there, right? And so that's a good check. In fact, I think I make you do it. I know I make you do it. Part 2F, are the mean and the median similar? What does that mean? So at that point, you'll have the mean, you'll have the median, and you'll be able to compare them. So, any questions about that? Just keep going. Got it. What part was that? My parts are all... D. So, next thing we're going to learn how to do, yeah. Um, you're going to just use the central two values as, for finding the median. Yeah. So, the next thing we're going to do is find the interquartile range, right? We've talked about it. We know it's the spread that we should be using if we have a non-normal distribution, but here we go. So find the interquartile range of distances flown. First of all, we need to talk about what is the interquartile range? So the interquartile range, remember, is, I'll just write it out here once, the interquartile range. Inter means between, right? And the range, of course, is kind of a distance, right? So it's the distance between your first quartile and your third quartile. Right, so if you've split your data into quarters, right, first quarter, second quarter would be the data point that splits your data in half, right, so that is the median. Third quarter, fourth quarter, you've got all of it. Right? 
So now we're just going to keep splitting up our data. All right, we've split it in half. Now we're going to split it into quarters, and those are our quartiles. So the interquartile range is the distance between the first and third quartiles. So for notation, what we use is capital Q subscript one. This is gonna be the first quartile, and so Q1 your first quartile. And it splits the lowest 25% of data from the highest 75% of data. Lowest 25 below and highest 75% above. Q2, we're never going to call it Q2, right? Q2 is the median, All right? The lowest 50% below and highest 50% above. Finally, Q3 is the third quartile. Third quartile has the lowest 75% below and highest 25% above. So it depends on, right, so first thing you're going to do, and I'm just going to go copy these sorted values. I know you have them. Just so I don't have to sneeze. So we've got the median, right? So we've got the data point that splits our data in half. Now a quarter, right, would just split the lowest half in half. Right? And then the third quarter would split the highest half in half. Right? So what we do again is essentially just find the median of the data points below the median, and then find the median of the data points above the median. That's finding the quartiles. And so it depends on, because here, right, the difference is here we use 2.8 as our median. Okay. The rule is if we've used it, we can't use it again. Right? So it's out for counting, uh, for our boop boop booping. Here, we said, well, neither of these are actually being used as the median. Right? The median is here at this line. Right, so depending on the situation that you have, right, whether you've circled the number or if the median is at the line, here, because the median's at the line, then you're going to start your booping from just beside the line. Right. Whereas here, since you've used it, you have to start at 2.1. Regardless, on this side, we're going to start at 2.1, where it's going to change. We don't have this last data point here. So here we've used this, so it's out. So we have to start here and here, right? Oop. I've got to take the average here. Whereas we 
can use our 2.8, and then we can book, book. Now we're taking the average of 3.4 and 3.5 instead of 3.4, or 3.5 and 4.7. So just little differences, but we know, or we need to know how to deal with both of them. So. <laughs> I'll do a different color. I'll just show the quartiles first and then I'll make a little note about the rules that we're applying. Okay. So if we've used the median, right, as a number, then we can't use it again. So for the first quartile for our nine data points, we're going to start at 0.5 and 2.1 and then boop our way in. Use a different color for our, and same method, right? If you're taking the average of two values, you're going to circle them and put a line through and just say that Q1 is 1.3 plus 1.9 divided by 2, which if memory serves me from this morning is 1.6. Same thing on the upper end, right? we can't use 2.8, so we're going to start at 3.4 and 7.1 and boop our way in here. So Q3 is 3.5 plus 4.7 divided by 2. I get 4.1. Now let's see what happens if we have eight data points, right? So if we've taken uh, the median as an average of two values, right? So the bar is the median, so we can use our 2.1 and 0.5 and boop our way in. We end up taking the average of 1.3 and 1.9 again. 1.3 plus 1.9 divided by two, still 1.6. We said the one that's going to change, right, is our Q3. So now we can start at 2.8 and 4.7 and boop our way in. Q3 is 3.4 plus 3.5 divided by 2. 3.4. So I'll make a note here. If we have used a value as the median, we can't use it in finding our quartiles. So if we have used a value as the median, right, see first example above, We can't use it again to find the quartiles. Whereas If we have taken the average of two values to find the median, if we have taken the average of two values to find the median, I'll 
I'll say C second example above. We can use the values on either side of the line to find our quartiles. We can use the values on either side of the line to find the quartiles. So we have our quartiles now, right? For each of these examples, the question was find the interquartile range. The interquartile range, right, is the distance between Q1 and Q3. How we're going to find those mathematically because Q3 is always larger than Q1, right? And so the interquartile range is going to be Q3 minus Q1. That's how you're going to find the interquartile range. So the work is really in finding uh, the quartiles, the median and the quartiles, right? And then finding the interquartile range isn't that bad. So the interquartile range, we'll do it for the nine data points and then for the eight data points. So for nine data points, We have an interquartile range of Q3 minus Q1. And what you'll notice is that I try to always give the, the empty formula that I'm about to use. And the reason for that and the reason I encourage you to do the same is in case you have copied it down wrong or whatever, then at least I can say, oh, well, you actually are using the wrong formula, but you plugged in all the values correctly. So that's worth something, right? So it's kind of uh, to save you some marks, right? To show what formula you're about to use and then plug in the values. So Q3 for the nine data points was 4.1 and Q1 was 1.6. So 4.1 minus 1.6, I get 2.5. So this would be our measure of spread for this distribution. You can do the same thing for eight data points. interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. Q3 was 3.45 and Q1 was still 1.6. Any questions about that? So that's finding the quartiles, and then we can find the interquartile range. So, what part was that? F. Kind of. You'll notice, right, if you've had a flip through the assignment, and if you didn't get one yet, then just grab one after class. I've got a 10 here. Um, right, I give you two lists of values, 
one has uh, 10 data points and one has nine, surprise, surprise, making you work with an odd and an even number of data points, right? And nowhere on here do I ask you for the median or the quartiles, but I do ask you for the five number summary, okay? So the five number summary is the minimum, Q1, median, Q3, maximum. Okay. So finding the five number summary involves finding the median and the quartiles. So part F, I'll just make it, find the five number summary. And for now, or for this, I'll just do the, the nine data points, those original nine data points, right? Kind of the, the deviation where we had to look at how does it behave with eight data points uh, or an even number of data points, we're done with that, right? So now we'll go back to just nine data points. So uh, use the nine data points. I'll just end it there, use the nine data points. So the five number summary is the minimum Q1, median, Q3, and the maximum. We have to list them in this order or if you want to start at the maximum and go through maximum Q3, median Q1, minimum, fine by me, but I like to start from the smallest and move my way down to the largest. But they have to be in this order or reversed. Right? So I don't want to see Q1, Q3, median. Right? That's, that's no good. Yeah. So in our case, I like to just kind of rattle off the, the minimum and the maximum because those are easy to do, especially because we've sorted our data already, right? So the minimum we know is 0.5 and the maximum we just remember is 7.1. Q1 was 1.6 for each of these. And I think, uh, Two point no. Two point eight was the median, and Q three was four point one. We do these five number summaries, and the idea is that we're somehow supposed to look at this and say oh yeah, the distance between these is uh, way smaller than this distance. But I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's really hard to look at these values and say, unless this one's really drastic, right? And unless one of the distances is really drastic, it's hard for me to visualize how these are laid out. Okay. So later on, I'll show you a box plot, which is just a visualization of the five number summary. But there's another rule that we have to take into account when we're drawing our box plot. Again, it's not something that I personally think is important that you know how to draw, but it is something that you are supposed to come out of this course knowing how to do, so we're gonna do it. But in general, we're gonna make box plots just in the lab or with software, or I'm sure you can find an app on your phone. We have tools. But anyways, so, um, so we'll draw this as a box plot later on. Okay? But before that, and so find the five number summary. So the five number summary is question two, part A and B, right, for each of those data sets. Okay? Part G. Are there any outliers? Are there any outliers? Seems like kind of a, a little question to ask, right? but it's actually quite a bit of work. Okay. 
we're pretty good at looking at a list of data and saying, oh, that one seems weird or that one seems weird, right? But in terms of reporting on data, right, we need to have some sort of hard guidelines that say anything beyond this value on the lower end and anything beyond this value on the upper end, those will be outliers. And so what we use in this course is called the 1.5 IQR rule. Okay. It's one and a half times the interquartile range is the acceptable distance that will go down from Q1 and up from Q3. Okay. So those will be our bounds. Okay. And um, John Tukey is the one who uh, kind of invented this rule, the 1.5 IQR rule. Because a lot of the time people are kind of confused. Well, why is it one and a half? Why would we, why do we use this? Um, and I guess someone asked him one time and he said, well, one was too small and two was too big. So that's why we use one and a half. So there's no real rhyme or reason. There's lots of different rules that we could use, but the one and a half IQR rule is kind of the most widely accepted. So that's what we'll use. So we, We'll use the 1.5 IQR rule to find outliers. So it takes that interquartile range, it multiplies it by one and a half. And then what it says is, okay, for our lower bound, we can go down that distance from Q1. Okay. So I'll put it on here. And I think it makes more sense in kind of math terms. So the lower bound is gonna be Q1 minus one and a half times the interquartile range. Same idea, the upper bound Q3 plus, right? So from Q3, we can go up one and a half times the interquartile range. Anything beyond that point, though, is going to be an outlier. Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Any values beyond the upper and lower bounds will be considered outliers. So any values beyond the upper and lower bounds will be considered outliers. So for us, right, remember the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1, which was, I'll just do it again, 4.1 minus 1.6, I think 2.5, right? So I'm just using the nine data points. You can go ahead and do it for the eight data points, but we'll just do the one. So here, right, we'll start with our lower bound. Our lower bound, remember, is Q1 minus one and a half times the interquartile range. Q1 is 1.6 minus one and a half times two and a half so 1.6 minus 
3.75. Any values in our data set smaller than negative 2.15 would be considered an outlier. Right? Our smallest value, we just established our minimum value is 0.5. Right. So that's within the lower bound. So that means there are no outliers on the lower end. What I like to do, I'm just going to copy this little, our numbers, just to show you. Copy. what I like to do is just kind of visualize it like this, right? So I try to put my lower bound somewhere on this line, and then that's how you'll know if a data point falls beyond that value. So negative 2.15 would be somewhere there. On the assignment, I ask you, uh, does the offensive data contain any outliers? So one of, I'm only asking it for one of the data sets. Are there any outliers? Justify your answer with an explanation, right? So you can't just say yes or no. You have to justify it with words, right? And so here we're going to say, since there are no data points smaller than the lower bound, there are no outliers on the lower end. So since there are no values smaller than the lower bound, there are no outliers on the lower end. So you have to justify it, right? Why aren't there any outliers? What if we found, just consider this, right? What if we found our lower bound to be uh, 1.5, for example, right? If we had a lower bound of 1.5, that's where it comes in handy to be able to kind of sketch it in here. 1.5, because these are sorted, would go from here. And so not only do we know that there are outliers, we also know that there's two of them, right? And so it's helpful to just kind of sketch it in and then you'll know if there are any outliers and how many. So how about on the upper end? So we do the same thing for the upper bound just remembering that now we're going from Q3 and we have to go up this amount, right? So for the lower bound, it's Q1 minus one and a half times the interquartile range. For the upper bound, it's Q3 plus one and a half times the interquartile range. So Q3 plus one and a half times the interquartile range. Q3 is 4.1 plus 1.5 times 2.5 is 4.1 plus, I think it was 3.75. 7.85. Too much fun out there. 7.85, that's pretty close, right? But our 7.1 just squeaks in, right? And so if we kind of jot this down here, 7.85. Right, so all these data points are inside. So 
So since there are no values larger than the upper bound, right? There's no values beyond the upper bound. There are no outliers on the upper end. It gets kind of uh, monotonous writing these things out, right? But it's all the same. So since there are no values larger than the upper bound, there are no outliers on the upper end. So that was part G. Any questions about finding outliers, all that fun stuff? Okay. So part H is draw a box plot of the data. So how we do it. So I'm going to show you what it's going to look like when we do it in R, right? When we do it in the lab, uh, it's going to make the box plot like, like this. However, when we're doing it by hand, I'll show you how to just tip it and put it on the x-axis instead, and it's going to be a lot easier to draw. So I'll show you both, right, just so you can read either or. Okay. Um, let's talk about the basic anatomy of a box plot, and then I'm sure you'll all be able to draw one right away. A box plot, assuming you have a scale on the left-hand side, starts with a box. But uh you did it. Congratulations. No, not quite. Not done yet. Okay. In the middle, there's a line. And that's usually where I start if I'm drawing it by hand, is I draw the line, and that line is gonna be the median. Okay. Here, because our scale is decreasing, right? This is going up here. This value is going to be our Q1, our first quartile, and this value is going to be our Q3, our third quartile. So Q1, Q3. Here's where it gets a little bit trickier. Okay. So remember the lower bound and the upper bound? Let's say. You imagine, you put, it, put in these imaginary lines here, and this is your lower bound, and this is your upper bound. So this one isn't specific to any question that we've done. Right. I'm just showing you in general what it's going to look like. Okay. We're going to draw the whiskers, as they're called. Uh, so the whiskers are going to go to the smallest value. And or I started with the largest value, I guess. They're going to go to the largest value inside the upper bound. Okay. So they're either going to go to the maximum, right? In our case, the maximum is inside the upper bound, so it's just going to go to the maximum. Right. Or if we have outliers, right, and this is how it's going to show up in our box plot, if we have outliers, the line's going to go to the largest one inside the upper bound. Okay. And then anything beyond here, we're just going to indicate with stars. Right. 
And so oh, I guess I jumped ship there, upper bound. And then a star indicates an outlier. Right. So a star is a value that's been determined to be an outlier using the 1.5 IQR rule. And then same thing on the lower end, the lower whisker is gonna go to either the minimum, right? If everything, if there are no outliers or to the smallest value inside the lower bound and then indicate the outliers with a star. Here, I'll just do the minimum. Okay. So you can kind of temporarily add your lower and upper bound on there, right? and then draw your lines to whichever side. Yeah. So we'll make some notes here. To draw a box plot, one, draw a line at the median. So draw a line at the median. Two. What was the next thing we did? Draw lines at the quartiles, the first and the third quartiles. Draw lines at the first and third quartile. So. Connect them to make a box. Then extend the lower whisker to the smallest value inside the lower bound. Okay. So extend the lower whisker to the smallest value inside the lower bound. Indicate values outside the lower bound with a star. Indicate values outside the lower bound. Right, I'll put in brackets, outliers, All right, that's what they are, outside the lower bound with a star. And then do the same thing for the upper whisker, All right, same idea, go up to the maximum value inside the upper bound and anything beyond that is an outlier. Uh, do the same thing for the upper whisker. So vertically like this is how uh, most programs will give it to you. Right, but like I said, sometimes it's hard to figure out the scale on the left hand side, right? It's easier to look at a number line like this, just kind of plot out our points. And so for drawing box plots by hand, I recommend drawing them on the x-axis. Like 
this. So then you just need a number line. Okay, kind of keep going. Here we'll start at zero. I know that my data right by now we're very familiar with our data. So I know I have up to 7.1 that I need to squeeze in there. So I'll just kind of um, hope it goes well here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Got a little crowded, but whatever. Of course, if I'm asking you to draw a box plot on a test, then uh, I'll give you the scale, right? So you don't have to mess around making the scale. Okay. Let's just sneak our five number summary. That's what we're using. We already decided that there were no outliers. Right? And so I can make a little note here. Lower bound was negative 2.15 and the upper bound Seven point eight five, I think. So I'm going to start at my median. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two point eight. I don't know. I'll draw a line. Pretend that's at two point eight. So I always, I always start with my median. And then I want my Q1, which is 1.6, probably somewhere along here. Q3 is 4.1. Somewhere along here. Now I can connect these to make a box. Minimum is 0.5. Notice how it's a little bit shorter and the maximum was 7.1 there you have it a beautiful box plot this is supposed to tell us the distribution I don't find them that easy to read because uh, this makes it look like there's a lot of data here. That's not the case, right? Each of these splits our data into quarters, right? And so we kind of revert, have to reverse our thinking and say, okay, well, it took me this far to cover the first 25%, and then not that far again to cover the second 25%. Right? So at this point, I already have half my data. So that means I actually have a lot of data points in here, right, in that range. And then it took me a little bit longer to cover the next 25%, and then it took me really long to cover the final 25%. Right. So in terms of the distributions that we're used to looking at, right, we would have a bulb over here, and then it would just kind of smooth out. If it's symmetric around the median, then you have a normal distribution. Any questions? No? All right. I'll see you guys on Monday. If you didn't get an assignment, come grab it. Oh, yeah, you bet. Here, I'll just end this here.